uh, the private sector considered to be very dangerous. And so those shortages, uh, and I think that anybody who travels to, to Venezuela or anybody who meets a Venezuelan who um, you know, lives in Venezuela or lived in Venezuela during those, during those years, I think would confirm this statement that 2007, um, certainly my wife can, because we remember the um, problems that we had just trying to get milk in 2007. It was, it was practically impossible to get uh, skin milk and even regular milk. Was, was, um, and it's never been that bad, either before or after uh, 2007. So I think people would confirm that, that 2007. And so this was politically induced. Um, so that's one explanation. Uh, but there's another explanation, and that's economic. Uh, oh, before I go into to the economic explanation, I'd just like to say that you know, I consider that living in Venezuela uh, is somewhat of a privilege and for anybody who um, wants to know what's going on in Venezuela. There are a lot of sources of information and everything. But you, know, you get so many insights just talking to people, um, especially if you ask the right questions and, and you're, you're sensitive to where people are at. It all depends on how you go about it. But let me just share this one uh, comment that uh, somebody told me that is, is more than just an isolated comment. Uh, somebody that I know, a friend, actually, um, who hates Chavez and has a company, a small company, in Venezuela, in Caracas, it told me that he's doing quite well. Uh, he works with his wife. They, they've got a, uh, a company. And... Uh, that uh, at first uh, they were having a hard time, but things, things have really gotten better. Economically, he's doing well. He complains a lot about the government restrictions and controls and everything, but really, at the end of the day, he's making good money. But he told me that he would not invest in his company, that all he would do would be to buy the essentials, but he would not think in terms of buying big equipment or anything else. And furthermore, this person has a lot of money invested in the United States. He's 65 or 66 years old. What's that? Maybe that's very true. Yeah, well, I've asked the, the same question. Believe me, I've asked him and his wife the same question many times. Um, and they might end up in the United States. But they have, he's, he's got a lot of money. It, 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 I, don't, I don't really know how much, but he's got money in the States. And, uh, you know, he complains a lot. And, I, I told him once, um, why don't you, you know, you, you're, you're doing well economically. Uh, why don't you just um, retire? Why don't you retire? And, uh, you know, you've, got, you've been making pretty good money. and You can do okay. Maybe bring in some of your dollars that you have in the States and sell those dollars on the open market, not the official exchange rate, because it's a two-tier system. You sell, them, you sell those dollars on the open market. It's called a black market, but it really isn't a black market. It's uh, officially legal, but everybody does it. It wouldn't imply any risk at all, uh, and you'll be okay. Well, his response was, I wouldn't do that, and basically wouldn't do it because he doesn't want to contribute in any way to the well-being of the government, the, the um, uh, economic benefit of the government, that bringing dollars into Venezuela would, would benefit Venezuela economically, and for that reason, I mean, because when I, when I asked that question, his response was vehement. It wasn't, maybe I'll consider the idea, well, I don't think so because, you know, I, I'm, I've got to invest. It was that he wouldn't do it, obviously, because he doesn't want to support in any way. And he wouldn't buy the equipment for his company, even though his company is doing well, for the same reason. So I said to myself, if that's what a small-time business person is saying, you know, what are the big guys, what are the big shots saying? And it's, there's no secret that uh, the big companies or investing outside of, of Venezuela and uh, in Colombia. Um, so that those decisions are politically motivated. But in addition to the political motivations, um, the companies try to get a, around the price controls in many ways. Um, uh, for instance, in the case of construction material like cement and especially metal rods. Uh, both have um, been in short supply over the last year or so, but especially cement. At this particular moment, I'm sorry, especially the metal rods. The cement are now, is now being sold openly, but there were a couple months here at least in which 
people are having a hard time getting cement as well. And the way it works is that the companies, uh, uh, through uh, the, or the people who distribute those products, um, sell those products to the big construction companies. Because the big construction companies pay a higher price. Those prices are regulated. So if they were to sell those, pri those products, those commodities, to bricklayers, to people who, you know, construction workers who work for themselves or have a small kind of company with two or three uh, uh, helpers, um, they would possibly denounce the distributors because they're charging a higher rate. That's illegal. But the big companies don't do that. Um, they can afford to pay more. And there's a tacit agreement there in which they accept that arrangement. Uh, so that happens in the case of construction. In the case of food, it's really just the other way around. Um, if the distributors and the producers sell the food at a higher price than the regulated price, uh, and that food gets sold in the supermarkets at that higher price, uh, the government regulating uh, monitoring agency will step in and close that supermarket down at least for 24 hours or 48 hours, and that's what they've been doing. So the supermarket cannot sell those food products, those basic food products, um, in which the price is regulated, such as sugar, uh, cooking oil, um, coffee, and many, many other products, milk, uh, um, at a higher price. And so the distributors sell those products to middle people, and those middle people sell the products to um, street peddlers. And so you have a situation in which you go to the um, supermarkets, or you even go to the government outlets, such as Mercal uh, uh, and other state-run stores, and you can't get those products. But you walk around the street corner, and you have these street peddlers selling those products twice or three times as expensive as what the regulated price is. So these are mechanisms that are created. And it's not that the street peddlers are making a fortune, it's that the distributors are doing that. Okay? And the third mechanism uh, is what is happening in a big way, which is through c contraband, those products are being sold in Colombia. The Wall Street Journal says, according to the government, uh, the sale of products like coffee. They talk about coffee and they say um, coffee is being sold in Colombia because there's no incentive to sell it in Venezuela uh, because the prices are regulated. And it, in addition to that, the government is claiming that there's, contra that there's contraband going on, that this is contraband. Well, it's not that the government is claiming that this is contraband. It is by definition. Because if you have regulated prices and the coffee is being purchased at the regulated price, and they take it to Colombia to sell <coughs> it in Colombia, there's no price regulation in Colombia. Obviously, that is illegal. That's a, that goes without saying. Um, so the Wall Street Journal makes it seem as if uh, the government is making this claim that the distributors are not paying to export tax or they're not going through the legal channels, but it's not that. It's that they are violating the law by the mere fact that they're taking that coffee out of the country. So it's a more complicated uh, situation. The, the government has reacted by um, all kinds of controls, all kinds of mechanisms. But the end game is, uh, the final result of this tug of war between the private sector and the government is expropriation. So I, I think that this makes clear how complicated the process is. Uh, it's not simplistic as the opposition makes it seem when they say this is a blueprint, this is a government uh, uh, strategy um, in order to bring about socialism. It's really how to combat the problem of shortages um, and avoid the political repercussions of that problem of shortages. And it demonstrates just how complicated the democratic peaceful road to socialism is. Um, if you compare the democratic peaceful road to socialism in Venezuela in a highly polarized setting with socialist experiences in Latin America throughout, uh, social experiences throughout the world, 
in the 20th century. There is no question that in the case of Venezuela, um, the democratic road to socialism creates spaces, both within the movement for change, with, in this case, within the Chavista movement, uh, spaces and opportunities for a diversity of sectors that support the movement but have different visions and even different interests, because we're talking about different social sector, sectors that support socialism, support Chavez, middle sectors, the working class, trade union militants who belong to the working class, and the non-incorporated sectors of the, of the society, the street peddlers, the rural workforce, the workers who work for the formal economy, but for companies um, that employ less than 10 workers, they don't have trade unions, they don't have collective bargaining agreements, so that there's a diversity of forces and the democratic, legal, Pacific road to socialism um, has to uh, deal with infighting, with different visions, with different concerns, and different interests. And with regard to the opposition, the same thing. The opposition has a space, and they operate legally. And as I've discussed with the discussion about shortages, they have op they operated they operate illegally. Um, but the government just can't step in and through repression um, deal with that situation. Comparing the Venezuelan um, example with the Soviet Union in the 1930s, there were shortages. The wealthy producers in the countryside, known as the kulaks, mm -hmm. created shortages. They slaughtered animals. They destroyed equipment. Rather than accept collectivization and rather than accept the government's uh, emphasis on the urban uh, sector over the rural sector, uh, prioritizing the urban because after 1933, the threat of a German invasion, uh, invasion uh, obliged the government to emphasize uh, rapid industrialization to, to face that imminent German invasion. Um, and so the Kulaks reacted to those priorities and those um, uh, policies by creating shortages. And the government, Stalin, stepped in and threw them in forced labor camps and killed uh, thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, or if you go by Solzhenitsyn, millions of those uh, rural uh, property owners. Uh, so that in a democratic setting, uh, the options are different. The strategy has to be different. And the net result is that the situation is much more complex. And it's much more complex also if you compare Venezuela, if you compare 21st century socialism in Latin America with the older strategy, the older Marxist strategy, um, uh, and the experience of socialists in the 20th century, or during most of the 20th century, going back to Marx, in the 19th century, in which there was a working class um, strategy and a working class party, which was, in many cases, the Communist Party. They believed that the working class was the vanguard, uh, and they acted in the name of the vanguard. Um, the possibility that there were different forces that were supporting socialism that had conflicting interests were not really analyzed. Um, even though in some of Marx's writing, in some of, in, in Lenin's early writings, uh, uh, two tactics in, in 1902, he talks about um, the peasantry as an unreliable ally. But then after that, he kind of glosses over that. And Trotsky also discussed the peasantry, but there really wasn't much discussion. Um, uh, about different forces within that vanguard that may have different interests and different concerns. In the 21st century, the social composition of the force for change in Latin America and throughout the world is 